Innocent Lives Foundation is an organization that I started that is made up of security professionals that want to help save children from the horrors of child abuse. We use our skills to uncover and unmask those who try to anonymously hide online while spreading, producing, and profiting from child abuse material. for coming out tonight. This is our monthly uh, meetup for Southwest Florida InfoSec community or SPIFLSEC for short. Uh, we're located here on the Paradise Coast serving the greater Naples, Fort, Myle, Fort Myers area. And we are also known as DEF CON group DC 239 and we're associated with DerbyCon through the DerbyCon community groups. So we can be found in a lot of different social media uh, locations. So if you'd like to whip out your phone, Here's a bunch of QR codes, and this is always fun. I like to say, uh, you know, we're a security group uh, pushing QR codes. So hopefully you trust us enough to hold up your phone and scan them. If, if not, uh, you can always find us under SwiftleSec on most of these locations. Uh, we're out there on Meetup, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, we have our own website as well, SwiftleSec.com. And we're also hopefully organizing for our first conference for this region called Besides Naples. Uh, tentatively scheduled for October 2022, unless Omicron continues to wreak havoc, and then we might have to move it again, uh, unfortunately, because we'd really like this to be a physical meetup and, and have good attendance and whatnot. But we'll see how things progress in the next couple months. And then our favorite charity uh, is Innocent Lives Foundation, and this is their QR code to donate to them. It takes, them, takes you to their uh, hero page for single donations or recurring donations, if you will. Uh, and uh, if you don't know who Instant Lives Foundation is, um, they're a fantastic charity. Like I said, they're our favorite charity. Uh, we support them fully and everything they do. Uh, they hunt down um, child predators and, and gather evidence through uh, various open source information or OSINT techniques to be able to build a case and turn it over to law enforcement. Uh, they are not a vigilante group. You hear about those all over the place right now. They are a, a nonprofit group. They do not use offensive uh, hacking. Uh, they don't go out and try and trick people. Um, they're using evidence that's already out there to, to gather it up and, and make a case and turn it over. And so far, the unfortunate statistic, of course, is they've turned over well over 500 cases to law enforcement, uh, which is crazy. Uh, you think about that, that is child sexual abuse material or CSAM that's been gathered and turned over. Um, and the other, other statistic being uh, with each person who is turned over, that's um, an impact of, I think the, the current statistic is 100 children uh, are impacted by just one person, uh, which is a crazy statistic. And then thinking about they turned over 500 cases to law enforcement. So again, they're a nonprofit. Uh, group. So their funding comes from anybody who donates to keep them running and keep them protecting our children. So again, uh, please uh, consider donating to Innocent Lives Foundation. So in our local community here in Southwest Florida, we are a versioning technology uh, community here, and uh, we have a variety of different groups. So pretty much anything that fits your interest, uh, we most likely have a group for it. And if we don't, if you're here in Southwest Florida, why not create one? Because we're a friendly uh, ecosystem here and help each other out and, and cross-promoting, uh, attending each other's meetings and helping out in any way we can. So uh, just you, you can see here is a sample of different logos for different groups here in our area. Uh, one of them being us here is Southwest Florida SEC. Um, OWASP right there in the middle. Uh, we also run that one too. And that one meets uh, quarterly. There's Southwest Florida Data, which Daniel was running. Daniel, I think you're still searching for somebody to take that over. Is that true? That's correct. Yeah, if you're interested in uh, taking the lead and hosting these going forward, um, that'll be great. So the community doesn't uh, die. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out.
Yeah, I did see the notification on the meetup page for that community uh, is looking for somebody to take over. And I think eventually that expires. And so, and then it's gone. I don't know if you can actually get it back once it expires and, and Daniel stops paying. So definitely if you're interested, uh, please reach out to him. Uh, and Daniel is also the organizer for Southwest Florida Open Source, uh, another group that he's looking for, I think still looking for uh, a lead to take over on that one too. Yep, that's right. That one's fairly young. So um, yeah, there's even more freedom to change it. But I mean, both of them, if, if you have new ideas or, or thoughts, you can take them in any direction. It's just I, I came across a number of responsibilities and I'm no longer able to run them. But yeah, I'm happy to help and support at the beginning or to transition uh, for either one of them. Hey, how's everything going? Y'all just in traffic? That, uh, mute Kevin there. All right. So uh, we have Southwest Florida Coders. So anything program related, that's your group. They cover pretty much any type of program out there, programming language out there. They've got somebody there who is a specialist in it. Uh, generally, they have one or two meetups per month. I know before the whole pandemic, it was usually two. One was a, generally a presentation, while the other was uh, more of a um, hackathon or, or, or type of event where you could come in, bring your projects, ask questions, get help, and stuff like that. Uh, so a great group. They're probably our largest group in the area and been around for a long time, large membership, very helpful. Uh, anything you need to know about programming, uh, they're the folks to reach out to. Uh, Pi Lady Southwest Florida. Uh, slightly younger, but nonetheless um, has a great membership and continues to move forward with their meetups. So anything Python related. I didn't see if Inessa joined us. She's the organizer. Go down the list here. Uh, nope. So anyway, uh, watch for them. If you're interested in Python at all, uh, they're on meetup. And in fact, all these groups have meetup pages. So if you're interested in any of them, uh, search them out on Meetup and then you can find out when their next meeting is. Uh, VR and AR Southwest Florida is a, is a young group that started, uh, I think just this past year, I don't think they passed their year mark yet. And uh, they've been having meetups uh, on virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, all the realities. Um, I, and they've been switching back and forth most recently between virtual events, um, like here on Zoom, although they have had a couple of events where they had uh, virtual, so that was interesting. And uh, they've had some now uh, where, they, where they're doing hybrid, where they're switching back between uh, Zoom type meetings and in physical, um, uh, in real life physical meetings uh, to uh, one of their recent meetings, uh, not this past one, but the, one of the slightly previous ones was um, a meetup where they showcased uh, the companies here in Southwest Florida that are doing anything with virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, which is fantastic. A lot of companies came out uh, this is something definitely it seems like uh, companies are exploring. I, I know my employer is exploring it heavily uh, to see how we can apply it to medical devices. And so there's st definitely some exciting research going on there. And other companies here in the area, like real estate companies are using it as well. And other health companies. And I mean, there's just a lot of companies that showed up uh, to, to showcase the technology and research that they're doing. So, and that was here in Southwest Florida. So that was fantastic to see that. Um, then there's WordPress. If you're interested in WordPress, uh, check out the WordPress meetup in Southwest Florida. And then Southwest Florida Tech, uh, which is, used to be called Regional Technology Partnership with Southwest Florida, they rebranded. And I think they're going to be starting their, their meetups in January. They're going to be restarting. Uh, and they're uh, around to help uh, grow technology here in the area, as well as run one or two career fairs too. And like I said, there's other groups uh, here in the area that I just don't have logos for or enough screen space to fit. Upcoming events, uh, like I said, all of those uh, logos that you saw, the uh, meetups groups that I uh, described, they are all on Meetup. So if you're interested, just search them out. I, I won't be on this slide very long, but of course we are recording too. So uh, you can definitely check it out later. Uh, on our YouTube channel once I get it uploaded. Uh, the other group here that didn't have a uh, meetup page was Isaka South Florida. Uh, they are still, as far as I know, just on a website and you can go there to their calendar and see uh, when their different talks are occurring at. So now I take a pause here so that you don't have to listen to, listen to me the whole time. 
and uh, just take a pause, give the mic over to the attendees here. Tell us your needs. Are you seeking a, a job, a new job? Uh, are you seeking to hire somebody? Are you looking for additional resources? Uh, do you have some other needs you want to uh, mention to the group here while you've got the chance? Uh, feel free to speak up now. This is your time, and I'll pause here for a few moments. Um, my name is Lillian Peterson. I have um, a certification in Security Plus and Network Plus. I just passed my Network Plus exam today, actually, and I'm looking for work. So just throwing that out there. Thanks, Liam. Anyone else? All right, well, if, if there's someone else or you're, or you're too shy to speak up, which is okay as well, uh, we do have the chat, so feel free to post your information in the chat, uh, connect with people across the chat on here. Uh, later on, I will also dump in our Slack channel invite. So if anybody's interested in joining the Southwest Florida Security Simple Sec Slack, um, that invite will be there. It's open, so any of you attending tonight can join and uh, continue the conversation there and, and learn and network and all that great stuff. So um, I'll take one more pause to see if anybody else uh, has any needs or wants. Yeah, hi, my name's Alan. I'm uh, from New Zealand. Um, kind of joined the group because I'm interested in Sericata and um, we're trying to develop a security platform at the moment. Um, been spending the last six months studying security and bits and pieces that um, we need to be able to do. And it's, it's actually a bit of a shock to me how little people actually understand about security and, and what the means are. Um, really had my eyes open to security in the last couple of months. I don't know whether you guys have started playing over there with zero tier or you're using zero tier a lot. Um, one, the zero tier is a great product, but one of the things that zero tier really does is demonstrate how insecure probably 95% of people's networks are. Um, and we had a, we had a situation, um, we run a data center with, we probably look after two to 300 networks. And uh, we had a situation where we actually put some filters on to filter out looking for zero tier traffic. And we found a lot of our customers had zero tier on the network, didn't even know it. And in one particular instance, we had a customer who had um, zero tier and it was on one of the IoT appliances. It was actually on a fridge, believe it or not. And they had up to 300 people accessing that fridge or that the, the, the network on that fridge. So kind of interested in it from that perspective. And I don't know whether I'm in the right place or I'm not in the right place, but obviously we were looking at Sarah Carter from that perspective. So um, that's the position that we're in. I don't know whether this is the right forum to be doing that in or, or whatever the situation is. So yeah, thanks for letting me in. Yeah, thanks for swinging by, Alan. You're welcome anytime. Uh, New Zealand, eh? So you're uh, also in a, a quite late or early <laughs> uh, time. So I appreciate you joining us and, and reaching out. Um, yeah, definitely. Maybe that's something our presenters can uh, talk about a little bit later on during their presentation and, and question and answer. Uh, bring that up again and, and talk about how to detect different things on the network, maybe. So uh, you're in the right place. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, well, I'll just go through my quick needs uh, real quick. Uh, as for some of you who has been in the previous meetings, you know I work for Arthrex, which is a largest, the largest medical device manufacturer here in Southwest Florida. And uh, we currently have quite a few openings in the IT department whether it's uh, business analysts or application analysts or infrastructure, um, I think it's analyst or engineer, can't remember the title at the moment, but uh, you know, networking, infrastructure, uh, virtualization, is you name it, we probably have a position open right now for it. So if you're interested in, in finding a role here in Southwest Florida, uh, definitely reach out. I'll post the careers page to, to the chat here in a moment. And so you can check out the openings there, uh, but we're always looking for great talent and, and some of the positions now, they are a bit more open to remote work as well. So if you're not looking to relocate to uh, sunny Southwest Florida here on the Paradise Coast, um, 
you must be in a, a much sunnier location, I guess. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, check it out. And uh, like I said, I'll drop that link in a moment. So again, we're Southwest Florida InfoSec community or SimpleSec for short. I'm gonna throw, throw up our QR, QR codes here left and right uh, for our QR code to our website, as well as our uh, favorite charity and Lies Foundation. We'll give it one more time and I'll, I'll move the, the window out of the way if anybody wants to scan and, and, and check it out. Uh, anyway, uh, we wanna thank the following before we move into our presentation. So always thankful for Innocent Lies Foundation, everything they do in the communities they're involved in and protecting our children and help educate others on how they're, how, and, and families on how to protect their, protect their or children, sorry. And also for tonight, we wanna to thank Open Information Security Foundation or OISF for uh, working with us to bring us uh, Juliana and, Sh and Shivani as our uh, presentation tonight for Sericata 101. So super thankful for you guys, uh, for you all to come out here, especially in the time zones that you're into, uh, taking time out of your evenings or mornings uh, and sleep schedules. Uh, to join us and, and go over this presentation. Uh, then we also want to thank our members, without which SlipleSec uh, would not be successful at all. Like I said, we've been meeting for over two and a half years now, uh, and we've never stopped. The pandemic didn't shut us down. We, we were able to pivot right from physical to virtual, and people still kept attending. So thank you so much uh, for showing us the value here in the community of having this group and continuing to be able to provide uh, training and networking opportunities and just good, good hopefully good overall conversation. Uh, but thank you much. And then Southwest Party Community Organizers, all of those other meetup groups that I talked about earlier, just we want to thank them because they are selflessly operating to lift others. Many of these groups operate freely. You don't have to pay any dues. You don't have to pay um, event costs or anything like that. They're holding their meetups out of their own pocket. So uh, they just, like I said, are operating selflessly here in this community. And we really appreciate everything they do. And all the, and and we just trying to help out each other and, and grow this awareness for all these different technology topics out there and anything we can do. So thank you very much. All right. So from here, I'm going to turn over. I'm going to stop sharing my slides, and then I'm going to turn over sharing to Juliana, and you can take over from there. So here, one moment, you will get an invite to become the host. Okay. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, not seeing anything yet. Oh, in the meantime, I will say hi to Josh, who just joined us. We also have Jason Ish from the Suricata team as well. And we have Sam, who is one of our outreach interns for the next three months. So special welcome and thanks to them for supporting us today here. <laughs> uh, I don't see anything. Not sure if it should be. Uh, it looks like, looks like it, it just moved over to you automatically. I guess it didn't notify you. So oh. it says on my screen that you are the host now. Oh, wow. That's interesting. You have, you have all the power. So. <laughs> OK, let's see if I can share my screen without any bleeps and blobs. Uh... All right. Just bring this here. Uh... Please let me know if anything is weird. Can everyone see everything fine? Looking good. All right. Does this work? I want the. Yeah. Okay. So, welcome to our Suricata 101 presentation. This will be a fast and furious introduction to the near network security multi tool because it's a lot to cover in, in just an hour or so, but we'll do our best. Um, so, here's a quick overview. There it's the introduction to Suricata, how to install, install it. Uh, is it black for you guys? 
Okay. <laughs> um, that looks great. So, okay. How to install it, uh, how to use it in a home network, mostly a simple setup that you could use in that case, different ways to ingest traffic, well, that Suricata ingests traffic, different logs that Suricata outputs, uh, role management with our tool Suricata update, two real world malware examples. They will be just us showing up things because there isn't a lot of time and how can you contribute to our community in case you are interested. So a bit about ourselves. First, a disclaimer, both uh, Shivani and I are not from the InfoSec field itself. We are developers who work with Suricata, so we are not really experts in threat hunting or any of that. Uh, so we might not be able to answer uh, difficult questions on that regard if you want to, to know about Suricata, but we will share uh, links to our forum and our Discord channel where you, you will find amazing folks who can help you. And this disclaimer also relates to how you could contribute because as the Suricata team has um, developers who are not experts on the, the field of cybersecurity, so to speak. The community helps us a lot. And that's the thing that Victor says uh, many times that the community is really important for us. Um, so disclaimer over, uh, I am Juliana Fajardini. I am a shy cat currently with blue hair. Uh, <laughs> I'm a junior developer at OISF. I joined the team uh, in the middle of the year First, I was with them for an outreach internship from December of the last year to March of 2020. And currently I work with uh, Rust parsers. I'm developing the PostgreSQL parser for Suricata, um, other minor tasks with Suricata, and also I write documentation. If you want to reach out to me, these are my social media links. Eventually, there are some blog posts as well. And yeah, uh, Shivani, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hello all, I'm Shivani. I'm a junior developer at OISF. I've been with OISF in total of uh, a little over three years now. I started as a part-time developer with uh, very few hours in a week, and then I moved on uh, um, and I was only developing the uh, Python tools at that point in time. And then I moved on to being a full-time developer sometime in 2020, and also uh, the development of Suricata. I work on Suricata and all our Python tools. Uh, that is Suricata Update, which is our rule management tool, which we are going to cover in this presentation later. There's also Suricata Verify, which is our in-house QA tooling. And there's Suricata Socket Control, which is a tool that you use to communicate with the running instance of Suricata uh, via Unix socket. Um, these are my social media links here if you want to get in touch or know anything more about me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so short introduction. Uh, first lines of code for Suricata were written in 2007 by Victor Julian. Um, the first public beta version was out in the New Year's Eve of 2009. You can check more of our story in our web page. Uh, it's powered by open source GPL version 2, so you can find our source, source base on GitHub, OSF slash Suricata. We have a community uh, of developers and, and contributors in over 23 different countries. That includes our outreach interns. And so it's really cool and rather diverse on that um, sense. And we are owned and supported by, well, we, Suricat, of course, <laughs> owned and supported by the Open Information Security Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation in the US. You can also check more about us on osf.net. Uh, what is Suricata? Probably most of you already know, but 
It is a high performance network monitoring and security engine with active and passive networking. I'll show uh, some illustrations about that. Uh, metadata, data logging, and real time file identification and extraction. It produces a high level of situational awareness and detail, detailed application layer transaction records for, from network traffic. And a very important thing to us, it's community driven. Um, so what all of those words mean, uh, we have those beautiful images provided by Josh, uh, who made them. So this is some explanation or visualization of what passive monitoring means. Uh, what Suri does in this case is that it will be watching your network setup without interfering in the traffic that you have. Uh, it does that powered by the Suricata rules, which will be explained by Shivani, and it will generate alerts, metadata, file information, and it can also log pickups, capture pickups. Uh, all of those uh, can be used directly to analyze the network traffic, or they can be fed to other tools. We will mention a few. In this sort of scenario, Suricata will not interfere in the, the traffic, it just watches. That's why you need a, a port that will uh, duplicate the traffic to, and it will generate uh, information for you to understand what's going on in your network. Um, and with active monitoring, Suricata will actually drop or reject traffic that is considered a malicious based again on the rules. Uh, and then there are lots of possible uh, setups for this, but this is just a visualization again. And we will also have alerts, metadata, and all of that for you to understand what's going on uh, in case you have some suspicious activities going on. So for installation, we've decided to cover it for Ubuntu. There are lots of other options, but as the time is limited, let's focus on one. If you want to see more options, you can go to our documentation, Suricata, read the docs, and then there will be other options there as well. And you can, as I've mentioned, uh, find it on GitHub in case you want to check the code itself. So for Ubuntu, uh, before you install, it's good to have uh, software properties common installed. Uh, then you add our repository, the PPA is OASF slash suricata dash stable, then sudo update, apt update, sorry, and then install the list stable suricata with sudo apt get install suricata. With that, uh, you'll be able to run Suricata and you can check that it's, it, it is running with uh, sudo system control status Suricata and you can check what is the build information which is important because then you will see lots of parameters like uh, where was it installed and what it is considering for installation for and where should it uh, be saving logs and things like that because sometimes we get uh, lost with different possibilities of configuration so with suricata build info you get all of that and if you still have some issues with that you can always check suricata yaml and you will see there as well where suricata expects or plans to be saving files, logs, uh, rule files, and all of that. Uh, all right. So basic setup for configuration is to configure your home, Mac and home net and network interface. Um, network interface in the Suricata YAML file. Um, for me, it was ENP3S0, but that of course will change. And for the home net, you see what covers yours, and then you can comment out the others, or you can also uh, leave it as is, and this will also work. I'm talking mostly for um, basic setup, like a home network. I'm not an expert for um, a business or big corporate setup, so I will not 
tell you how to do that. <laughs> it could have a, a more complex setup, most likely. But if you want to and you join our forum, you will have folks to help you there as well. Once you have configured, you restart Suricata with restart. And then I think this status part is wrong. Uh, and then restart Suricata and it should work. Um, one way to check that Suricata is running and generating alerts is to fetch the basic emerging threat open rules. You can do that by running Suricata update, which will be covered by Shivani. And once you have that, you can visit uh, a web page like ifbox.org slash test my ideas. And that will generate uh, an alert that can be checked in our fast log. One way to do that is with tail, and then you will see an alert for uh, the suspicious activity that is generated by this. Um, the fast log is a log that basically generates alerts. It is not our most powerful one, but for checking that Sura is generating alerts, it works well. And I've mentioned that uh, we would talk about a possibility of how to have Suricata running at home. Um, I've translated a blog post where uh, someone shared how they did it with a mirrored port, a Raspberry Pi, it could be three or four, and then it could work for both um, wire traffic and wireless traffic so we think it's really interesting and if you want to to try that out these are, are the equipments that are necessary and then you can check the blog and see how to do that i think that's a nice experience to try out at home uh, and now i pass the floor over to shivani who will cover a few more topics yeah, more like a Zoom window. <laughs> OK, um, next slide, please. Thank you. So Surigata can ingest traffic two ways. One is via the network uh, at the active network interface on your system or via PCAP. PCAP uh, ingestion is something that you would use to analyze traffic once something has already happened and you want to see what uh, how the activity or the event actually took place and what were the events leading to it. We would use it uh, for testing. We have a lot of uh, PCAPs, uh, a huge collection, mostly from different sources in our QA tooling, for example, which we feed to Suricata in a similar manner in order to test it out for certain behaviors. Um, next slide, please. And Strigata has different types of uh, logging mechanisms. We are discussing the most common ones here. The first and most popular one is eJSON. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, it generates, uh, uh, it's basically JSON logs, which are generated as per your configuration, which, it, which uh, means that only the things that you have enabled in your configuration and which Suricata is actually looking at as detecting would be logged in the eve.json uh, file. There is a lot of metadata if you want to uh, analyze more of the things. You can see a little example here with some common fields, like uh, we have event types, which could be alert or any of the protocol that you might be looking at, and there are the IPs and ports, source and destination, there's the protocol DCP, uh, if there was an app layer protocol that would also, also be mentioned here. And since it's an alert, alert has its own uh, set of metadata as well. Like uh, it tells us which rule, which signature exactly caused this alert and what category does it fall in and how severe it is. Um, you would by default find the 
uh, logs under war logs Ricada, and it's been extremely useful with the rise of elastic search. Uh, you can find Suricata logs and do analysis and better visualization with some other tools uh, because of the JSON format. Next slide, please. Um, the Lua one. Sorry, it got lagged. Okay. So uh, here is an example of generating logs with Lua. Uh, this is, so we would mostly see uh, people uh, using Lua and where it's useful is uh, some things that you can't define in rule, uh, rules or you're more comfortable with scripting than you are with writing rules because those things need to be in proper order for Suricata to be able to detect anything. So here, if we uh, define in Lua script, what exactly are we looking at and what we want to see, what are the parameters that should match and what exactly the output should look like. Like the example that you see here, this is defined in a file, like we want to first write the timestamp and then write the URL and the user agent and stuff like that. So this is all that you get to control if you're using scripting language. I saw a case where uh, somebody used Lua scripting method recently on our forum where they were trying to find out uh, um, self-signed DLS certificates, which is something that was not uh, seeming possible with rules and they used Lua scripting for that and it worked out well. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, please go to the previous one. Um, here is a Suricata verified test example, if, in case you're wondering how to write Lua scripts for Suricata. So uh, there are a bunch of scripts in there, so you can take a look at them, different outputs and different handling different things. Suricata provides uh, its own uh, uh, set of functions that you can use to extract things. So you would find examples of those functions, example usages of those functions and these tests. So Suricata Verify is a great place if you want to check out rules or traffic or how Suricata would, would behave in a certain situation or how to write scripts or anything like that. Next slide, please. And here we have an example of HTTP logs, uh, which is a line-based log of HTTP requests. It would only consist of HTTP requests as opposed to um, Eve JSON, which would have everything that is enabled in suricata.yaml file. Whatever you allow suricata to log in its Eve JSON format, it is gonna log. Here with HTTP log, if you enable it in this, uh, the lower section you see is a screenshot from suricata.yaml configuration. So you can, uh, if you enable it, you can also provide your custom file name and you can have a certain uh, different features here. Like you can uh, ask for extended logging information from suricata so it, the logs would be more elaborate than they would usually be. And you can also define your custom format here. Uh, if you want to see certain fields in your HTTP logs for sure, like methods or uh, where the request is going or anything that you might be interested in. Next slide, please. Um, this is another type of log, uh, pretty much similar to the one we discussed right before this. This is also a line-based log, but for TLS handshake parameters, again, the same parameters, you can enable it, you can have uh, extended information here, and you can also provide a custom uh, format here. So in case you want, are looking at, this, you know, uh, always logging who was the certificate issuer or what was the subject or what was SNI and things like that, you can uh, 
customize them and make sure that they are always logged to this log file. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so we are now discussing Suricata rules. Rules are the backbone of detection. If you don't have the right rules in place, detection will not place, take place. Uh, rules are also called signatures. You would see people use that, the, these two terms interchangeably many a times. And they are available by many leading threat hunting companies like Emerging Threats. And it's possible to write your own rule set and use that too. So uh, we have an elaborate guide about how you can write your own rules, but it is kind of uh, a difficult process if you're not writing very basic of rules. Uh, some rules can get very complicated. So um, you are uh, always uh, welcome to use the uh, rule sets from uh, known and reliable sources. Uh, from uh, any of such uh, uh, threat hunting companies uh, which stay up, up to date and current to any of the new malware or anything coming into action because just Suricata won't be able to do anything uh, as long as uh, we have the correct rules in place, things would go fine. Suricata will keep on working as an ideas or ideas, however you've configured it to. Next slide, please. Um, here is a very basic example of a rule. Uh, it says something like alert HTTP, any, 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 this a message, content, HTTP URI and something. So the first thing that you see here, alert is actually a target, which means what you want to, <clears throat> I'm sorry what uh, you want to do in case, what you want Suricata to do in case this entire signature actually matched. And the second parameter is uh, the protocol that you want to match on. And then any, any that you see on both the sides from and to uh, are first is the IP address um, and second is the ports to match. Then you are supposed to give a good, uh, message generally so that you can see it in your, uh, if you remember we saw in our uh, basic logs that we saw earlier that when we have an alert, it has its own metadata uh, in eve.json. So that's where your message will show up. And here we are essentially just telling that if the HTTP URI contains the dummy.html content, we have to raise an alert. Uh, SID is a uh, signature ID of the rule. It's very important to uh, have a signature ID that's unique. Otherwise, Suricata can get confused. It's all right if you have uh, uh, different revisions. Uh, so when rule writers are writing rules and they're updating keywords or the rule that kind of does the exact same thing, but it needs some updation, um, like in, in terms of keywords, like I said, so they'll update the revisions, but the signature ID remains the same. So that's where that is useful as well. Next slide, please. Um, uh, rules are uh, essential to Suricata, but uh, we can, uh, uh, but since they are difficult to manage on their own, things like, uh, uh, well, uh, if you are writing your own rules, it's probably a bit easier, but if you want to stay updated with everything that is out there and you want to stay current, then you have our tool called Suricata Update. It comes bundled with Suricata. If you install it from the package that Shiliana mentioned earlier, the PBA repository, and you can install it separately for dev environment. It's written in Python. So uh, if you look at our code, it's, it's nicely written, very understandable, and uh, does a lot of things for such a little tool. It was written by my mentor, Chish. Jason Ish, who is on the call as well, I think. And uh, 
you can run it simply by uh, running suricata update on the command line once you have it installed and it will start fetching all the rules that are enabled in suricata update settings and uh, the good thing is if you don't know what all rules uh, rule providers do exist and what all you can use suricata update already uh, provides a list of vendors by default that you could enable and try to use if it works out for you. So there are a bunch of commands over there in Suricata update itself, which you would see if you uh, try to run the help output for Suricata update. Um, you can also define your own rule providers over there. Uh, you can add more uh, vendors, more uh, sources as what we would call them and have complete control over what you would like Suricata to pick up. So once you have Suricata update doing it all for you, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, where Suricata would pick up uh, the rules from because that is something that you do need to worry about. If, if it's a regular setup, you would have to configure it in Suricata every time. Here with Suricata update, Suricata update and Suricata kind of go hand in hand. Suricata knows where Suricata update would have kept all the rule files and um, that it can rely uh, on Suricata update for not breaking any references for certain keywords, which require separate rules, uh, separate files to be looked up by rules. Um, you can use this tool to manage rules provided by different sources, and you can add your own sources as well. You can check out the project on our GitHub, OISF slash Suricata update. Next slide, please. Now it's back to me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we wanted to bring something from the real world, and I thought of bringing something for L4J because that's fairly recent. Um, what I did was uh, I found out that Corelight shared a, a sort of tool for that. And they have two pickups here. So I used the read pickup method that Surikata, not Surikata, but Shivani <laughs> mentioned earlier uh, to read that pickup. I had my roles updated with Surikata update. So uh, from the ET open. Uh, rule set, I already had lots of, of rules that were uh, for detecting L4J activities for several different types of protocols and, and lots of things. Uh, so I, I run Suricata with uh, the PCAP and then we get lots of, of um, even types in our JSON that Shivani mentioned. I, filtered just for alerts, so I could see what was going on. Can you folks see when I select it like this? Awesome, uh, because otherwise it doesn't make sense what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so uh, if you select by even type alert, you will see all the alerts that were triggered uh, in that specific pickup file, but you could see for others if you had a bigger log file. Uh, and a very crucial um, feature that Suri has, and which is what makes it very powerful, and our logs very powerful, and which is uh, very useful when you are threat hunting and trying to understand what's going on if there's some uh, suspicious activity, is the field called flow ID. What this field does is that it will correlate all and, and, and you can correlate all the traffic that comes from the same source IP, same source port, uh, same destination IP, same destination port, and same protocol. So if you have that combination, Suricata will understand that as a, a single flow, and you can have different types of events showing. So I selected one flow from from this, so we could see the whole conversation for that flow. 
I filtered it and then we have this log file uh, showing we had an alert for the signature ID 234659. It's from ET, as I mentioned, and it's exploit Apache log 4 JRC attempt. And then we have lots of extra metadata that uh, we can investigate and explore. Um, information about the protocol files we've mentioned that Suricata also does file file extraction so if you have file store you will have you will see that as well uh, application protocol information about the flow then we have event type file info where you get information about files that happened in that um, that conversation that network conversation, so to speak. Um, then the magic, um, Shivani, I think we'll mention a bit about this as well. Uh, we had an event type HTTP, so we get information about that. We got another file info, and then finally we got the flow, which basically summarizes everything that happens. So the flow ID is a huge friend when you are trying to investigate something that is going on and it's certainly something that is uh, not to be missed if you are trying to understand how powerful our if logs can be. Uh, these files, these examples are all publicly available. So if you check the links, you can see them and also the, the PCAP that was used. So you can try and reproduce and, and see everything and, and get more details about that. Just be careful when you are running such PCAPs and where you get them from. <laughs> Always be careful, but you know that more than I do probably. Uh, now for Shivani, who will also share an example. Thank you, Juliana. Um, yeah, so we have this another real world example uh, taken from the malware samples repo of our very own, own Dr. Josh. Um, uh, it's about ICE ID, which is uh, a banking trojan uh, known to steal financial uh, information from people. Uh, first appeared in 2017, but has kept on coming back in different forms. And this is a, uh, uh, this is a few. There, these are the few alerts that you see from 2021 April attacks. Some of the, I think uh, at, around that time. And uh, uh, he, these alerts are in the tool called Evox that Juliana mentioned earlier, which is written again by my mentor Jason Ish, which is a nice tool to give you uh, uh, a very nice layout and not too noisy layout of alerts like you see over here. Um, so if you see in these logs, we are not really using any uh, of our own self-made rules. So this is all ET and the, because uh, it stays updated, it's usually nice to for us to stay current as well. And uh, most of the things might just work out this way. And uh, interesting thing to note here is that uh, Suricata in such cases where uh, the malware is delivered in some other form, like here it was uh, ICE ID, uh, the exact PCAP that we are talking about was delivered as an Excel file, a Microsoft Excel file. And uh, interesting thing to note is that Suricata is able to see through these files, one, with the help of uh, the rules in place, correct rules in place, two, with certain file related features, which are uh, used in the rules as well, uh, which kind of see through the file for what it actually is. The feature is called file magic. So uh, we, uh, with the help of magic numbers that already do exist for a file, we determine what kind of file it is and, and by, its, uh, by its mime type. So all of that part is taken care of by libmagic and that's what Suricata is using under the hood. 
and we are able to find out such files. So uh, any of the masked files are not really an issue if you are able to write the correct rules in place for determining what could be under those masked files and what should definitely be a cause of concern. And you can also use uh, the file info feature of Suricata to download any of such evil files. So if you, you can define it to Suricata that if you see any of the files which uh, have uh, uh, this extension or uh, are of this type, please download them because I would like to analyze them further and see if there was something wrong with them or something suspicious with them. So uh, there's that feature as well that uh, comes handy with uh, for uh, people who are threat hunting. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Here, uh, the BCAP is available on the link mentioned. So it can be a nice exercise if you want to uh, check out. You, uh, you would just have to enable the ED rules and run the speak app with Suricata and you should be able to see the alerts. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are a few tools we are featuring that go well with Suricata. There's CELTS, which is a free and open source Debian-based IDS IBS network security monitoring platform. It's released by, uh, it's made, developed and released by Stamus Networks, who are also a consortium member of OISF now. Uh, you can check out their project uh, on their GitHub, Stamus Networks slash Selks. S, the first S in uh, Selks stands for Suricata, so it's kind of a pretty big deal for all of that setup. Selks also has some pre-configured dashboards, so uh, you can take a look if, if that suits your needs. The Security Onion, which is a free open source uh, um, Linux distribution for threat hunting and security monitoring and log management. It comes with Suricata and a bunch of other security tools as well from what I have uh, read about it. Um, there's Surivire, <coughs> sorry, which is a plugin for Wireshark. It has been developed by one of our very own core team members, Eric Leblon. And it allows you to display Suricata alerts and protocol information as element of protocol dissection, which means that uh, it would show you info about Suricata parameters within the PCAP in the Wireshark dash dashboard itself. So it's uh, pretty useful. You can check out the, that project as well um, on Eric's GitHub, regit slash Surivire. It's fairly easy to uh, use and install. I think it's also a Lua script, so they ask you to just put it in the uh, plugin uh, directory of Wireshark. Next slide, please. Back to oh, me. <laughs> okay, yes. so um, there are lots of ways uh, in which you can get involved and, and you can help us. Uh, you can always test features, for instance, uh, I should be sharing a multiple version of the Postgre parser soon. And one of the things that we need is for folks to test it so we can check if there are any awful bugs that should not go out uh, in the next release and we can fix them as soon as possible. You can build features, you can suggest features, you can report bugs, that's also really important. You can write rules. Um, write documentation. There are always places where we could have more documentation. You can spread the word about us. Uh, you can invite us to spread our own word like you did today. That's great. Thank you. Uh, you can help other people resolve their issues on our forum as well. Sometimes you have used to cut in a way that someone else is trying to do and you know the answer for that question. It's an open community. There are no dumb questions and we are a really nice and friendly community. So it's always good to have more folks trying to help us there. Uh, and you can find us or get in touch with us, uh, sorry, with any organization that wants to fund us. So if you want to fund us, if you can fund us, please do it. If you know anyone who could be interested in that, 
also great. You can also try to find funds for our uh, annual conferences, uh, the Suricons. All of that is of great help. Um, what else? We wanted just to mention a few of the references and links that we used. Our documentation is online at suricatareadadocs.io. Um, there are lots of good videos on our YouTube channel, OASF Suricata. Josh provides awesome webinars. Also, Peter, we have uh, lots of guests there as well. There are dev um, dev related webinars lots of threat hunting also how to's so if you want to understand better how to use suricata update or seeing more detail how to install and run suricata you will find videos covering that there uh, you can ask questions on our forum as i've mentioned uh, our twitter is fairly active um, more details on the installation can be found on our documentation, of course. The blog post that I've mentioned for using Sudi with Raspberry Pi 4. Um, if you find uh, bugs or if you think of a cool picture, please uh, share tickets with that on our Redmine project. And if you are interested in working with Suricata or being part of our community, we have a fairly new Discord server where we are trying to gather folks. So um, where is Alan? I can see him, but yeah, uh, that would be a great channel if you want to connect and, and, and learn from others as well. We are also trying to post updates from the forum in the Discord and also about events, so yeah. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Questions are more than welcome. Thanks for your attention and for the invitation. Thank you, folks. Yeah, thank you so now, much for the presentation. Now I should give back control. Uh, if you would, please. Uh, I'll try to. <laughs> yeah, be an icon please keep by talking my, by while I try to do it. <laughs> sure. There, there should be an icon by my name or, or the, the ellipsis that you can click on um, by my name. And then in there, it uh, should say um, grant host or something or make host. Oh, yes, I'm now the host that. again. Got it. Thank you so much. There we go. Okay, now we're back. Uh, so Daniel had a question. Daniel, do you want to go ahead and, and ask? Yeah, sure. I was just curious. Um, so I have a Firewall uh, device at home, um, and I know that for the model I have, they allow you to run a bunch of different things in Docker containers. So I was wondering if you were aware of, off the top of your head, like any tutorials on how to run uh, Suricata as a Docker container, preferably preferably within a firewall box, but just any tutorial uh, related to that, I think would be useful. Uh, just probably a, a weekend project to see how this can be supplemented, uh, supplement the, the rules that I already have in this device with Neo rules. Uh, I think recently, was it Stamos who shared something about uh, deploying something on Docker in just a few minutes? And those are, uh, use uh, docker images provided by the great jason who is doing so many things for us i'll find the link and share it on the chat which have over two million downloads now <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to find that yeah I, I can definitely say i'm interested in the the concept of running it in a docker container as well mm. uh there's another question here uh, from Samuel uh, saying they may have missed it, but do you have a default rule set? And if so, how often is it updated? Um, so Suricata update by default would keep ET open there, emerging threats open rule set. We have uh, something of our own as well. Uh, 
which was earlier maintained when we had a couple of rule writers on the rule and uh, on the team. I'm checking if it's still uh, active. Yeah, I don't see it under the organization. I'll, I'll have to check about that. If, if uh, our in-house thing is still going on, uh, I think it was called Traffic ID, if I'm not wrong. Uh, that was the name of the uh, vendor. Oh, wait, so we got an update, might be able to provide that information. So let's move on to the next question. I'm checking in, so we got a bit, what's the name of mine? But by default, so we got an update, will keep emerging threats open as the default rule set. You can disable that, or you can have uh, other vendors uh, enabled as, uh, after that as well. Uh, great. Yeah, I see Andres uh, posted and said the last update was four years ago. So maybe there's better, more current uh, ones out yeah. there. That's for the Docker container, looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, so with the so question along the, the rule sets you, you, with emerging threats uh, and Suricata update, is that something that one needs to run Suricata update manually? Or is it when it's installed, is, 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 there, is there like a cron job set up or, or something else? So it's just automatically updating on, on a schedule in the background? So we don't have, uh, as of now, we don't have uh, that, but yeah, people would use cron job or other services to run so we got update on a very regular basis in order to stay current. Okay, so so you, it's it's up to the user, the end user then to either manually update or set up their own schedule for updating. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question. Let's see. How application aware is Suricata? Could an organization use it to drop traffic from certain applications, like a data loss prevention type of application? And that one's from JE. Um, I think uh, I think if you have current rules in place, yes, you can drop traffic from anywhere and any application, really. Uh, as long as it's not encrypted traffic, then sorry, I can't read inside it what, what, what's in there. So, yeah, uh, I'm not really sure what, uh, what, did, what did you say, data, data, what type of applications? Uh, so drop traffic certain, certain applications, like a data loss prevention type of application. So I don't know, JE, if you can expand on that, maybe something as an example would be if I want to prevent my organization, and if I'm off base, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if I want to prevent an organization, somebody within my organization potentially using uh, Dropbox or Box or uh, any of those share file or any types of sites like that to um, kind of exfiltrate data to you, uh, can I stop that um, with Saracana? I think so. With the active monitoring that Juliana discussed, uh, that would be the active monitoring since you're telling Saracana to take an action on your behalf and not just monitor and alert you. So uh, if you're trying to drop uh, the network, uh, um, drop certain packets, yes, uh, but you'll have to have the correct rules in place. Uh, for whatever applications you're trying to drop the packets about. Uh, if you want help with the rules, uh, you could ask on our forum. There are folks with really, who are really experienced on uh, these uh, professionals on uh, teams like Emerging Threats who can come around to help you with writing the correct rules for those things. I don't know if it makes sense to, to add this, but if uh, there's a specific application layer related, uh, then of course, Suricata has to um, have the feature to cover that uh, application layer as well. So for instance, for PostgreSQL right now, we don't have it. I'm working on that. So for PostgreSQL, MySQL right now, we wouldn't be able to, unless something in uh, other underlying protocols showed it. So if you were able to detect something in the content of 
the packets, then maybe, but it wouldn't be exactly application layer uh, detection in that case. I, you mentioned earlier during the presentation, there's the ability to, if you have a, um, a storage location, there's the ability then to also capture files. Um, can you explain on that further? Is it, is it now, does it only capture the file or is there the ability to also read the file's contents? Because I, I, I noted that at least it has the, the ability to use um, MIME types to ID, but is it also able to then scan additional contents of that file for other um, other items, other like keywords or anything like that? As far as I'm aware, no. You can only use the file store feature to store the files of a certain kind and then do analysis on your end. But I am I am not very sure about it, so I think I should also check the documentation. I was just thinking of an example to go JE's um, back to JE's question about the um, data loss prevention. I just think of the things like uh, if you've got files that are being exfiltrated to have credit card numbers or social security numbers, like if that could be picked up on uh, because it's internal to the document itself, or if it's like you mentioned, it's a, a different tool that needs to be used in a new file analysis. Uh, something that didn't come up with the uh, discussion was we saw a lot of like the alerts and stuff like that, which are which are excellent examples and how people could build the uh, the different rules or, or, or gather rules. And uh, the the what was it the fast is it the fast log is is yeah, one of them and then and then the eve yeah. is the other. Uh, is there a uh, GUI front end or user friendly front end for that, or is it again you're using something Elasticsearch or or and Grafana and other things to kind of build up a dashboard? So for reading eve.json, there's a simpler tool called Eve Box, uh, which we mentioned. Uh, so you don't have to go with the entire uh, Elasticsearch setup. So you could see your alerts over there. But I think you also need to configure file with module for that, if I'm not wrong. Maybe if Jason is around, uh, is Jason around? He wrote the application. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Okay. I so uh, I think we should share uh, the link for Evox's uh, GitHub project. Uh, it mentions, I think, file weight uh, setup as well, but it's much simpler than what you would do with an entire setup. If you want an entire setup, you could use Silk stock or image. They, they already have Suricata and the entire ELK stack uh, configured over there. So uh, for e logs, that is there. For fast.log and other .log files that we saw, HTTP, .log, et cetera, it's basically just text format and it's not a, a defined format. You define what you want to see in there. So you can actually control uh, whether you want certain information to be there and to not be there. So there's no, nothing uh, for that. You just, uh, and it's much more readable than uh, JSON logs are. So you don't have to filter or anything because you're able to control what you want to see over there. Uh, Juliana just shared the link of uh, Evox GitHub project, which has Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? I, I see, like, I think I've exhausted the questions in the chat so far. Uh, does anybody else here have any additional questions? Um, oh, all right. Um, <laughs> Thanks everybody for uh, attending and appreciate OISF being here and the, the presenters, both of you, Juliana and Shivani uh, for presenting. really appreciate, again, taking your time out of your days and evenings, sleep schedules uh, to come by and, and talk with us. Um, 
Well, we would certainly welcome you back anytime to expand on the topics and do additional deep dives if you're up for it later, maybe sometime later next year, we'll reach out, um, see what kind of cool projects you're working on and, and get you back in to talk about them, uh, do some show and tell or something. Uh, we'd, I know we would appreciate that. Um, and then uh, everybody else here who took time out of your days to attend as well, uh, we appreciate you coming in. Again, as a reminder, uh, the slides will be posted up on our Slack channel. Uh, if you check the chat, we did send out an invite in the chat to our Slack channel, so feel free to, to join us and continue the conversation there. Uh, and, and as mentioned um, uh, by our presenters on their slides, there is their link for their Discord channel uh, and their forums. So the, if you're interested in getting additional help and learning more about Suricata, definitely check those resources out. And then we're going to post this video up to YouTube uh, over the next couple of weeks. The holidays are are definitely going to slow us down a little bit in getting posted, but uh, please uh, keep an eye on our YouTube channel. And we will eventually get the, the, the video uploaded and uh, we'll probably send out a reminder to all the attendees too that that video has been uploaded. So that way you don't have to try and do the whole, uh, if you know YouTube, when you watch any YouTube videos lately, right? It's like, uh, make sure you click the subscribe button and hit that bell to get a reminder and all that stuff. No, you don't need to worry about that. We'll, we'll try and send out a reminder to everybody. Uh, but then uh, thanks again. Um, that ends the presentation, so I'm going to end the recording.